So now I welcome uh, Lord Martin Rees, who is here to give a talk on a cosmic lens on existential risks. Which is... yes. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, I, I'm fine. Can you see and hear me? Yes, we can see and hear you. Okay, right. Yes, yes. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me to join you uh, for this excellent group. I'm sorry I logged, logged on slightly late, so I didn't hear the beginning of what you said, but I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for being here as well. It's an honor to have you join us uh, for inaugural research symposium. Right. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Um, so um, uh, I was going to just uh, make a few remarks and you could have to ask me some questions. Um, but uh, um, just to introduce myself, um, I'm uh, uh, a cosmologist um, and uh, people sometimes ask, does the fact that I'm a cosmologist um, have any effect on the way I think about more everyday matters and think about the world? Um, I think it does just in one way which is that it makes me aware of a long-term future. The point here is that uh, unless you're a creationist, you're aware of the past and that uh, we are the outcome of about four billion years of uh, um, Darwinian evolution in the universe, which we now think has been expanding for nearly 14 billion years. Um, but uh, we now know that uh, the timeline ahead is just as long as the time that's elapsed up till now. Uh, the sun has been shining for four and a half billion years, and it's got about six billion more years before it eventually runs out of fuel, and the universe may go on almost forever. I like to quote Goody, Woody Allen, who said, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. Um, so anyway, that gives a perspective, and it leads me to realize that um, uh, uh, we are not the sort of um, end point of evolution. We're not the top of the tree, as it were, um, as many people think, even if they're Darwinians, um, because there's a lot, enough time in the future for a lot to happen. And uh, um, one of the implications of this is that um, we should care very much about uh, what we do now, because uh, this century is the first when one species, the human species, has a future of this plant in its hands. Uh, we can um, uh, perhaps inaugurate a more uh, benign and exciting type of society and evolution, or if we screw up badly, we could foreclose and destroy all those potentialities. So this is a, the first century of all the 45 million which the Earth has had since it was formed, where one species has this power. And so we are alive at a special time in a special place. And uh, that's what makes one think globally and think cosmically. And I find that a helpful uh, way to think. Um, so that's a bit of introduction uh, to myself. Thank you for that, Martin. I think sort of just going off on that, you know, the fear of extinction has always been around in humanity. If you look at sort of Marisha's Frankenstein or, you know, thinking from early ages. Uh, but do you think the cosmic fragility of life that, you know, we may be the only ones out here has played a key role in making us as a society care more about our future and ex existential risks in general? Yes. Um, well, of course, um, uh, um, the question that astronomers are most often asked is, are we alone? Is there any life out there? Um, the answer is we don't know. Um, of course, I come across lots of people who think they do know. I come across people who think, who've been abducted or they met the aliens, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, uh, I don't think they're very convincing. Um, I tell them to write to each other, not to me. Um, but um, I... I uh, realize this is a very important question and we may answer it this century because uh, uh, two important things have happened in astronomy. Uh, one is that um, we um, have realized that there are um, planets orbiting almost all the stars we can see in the sky. So uh, in our galaxy it's not just our solar system with its uh, eight planets but there may be literally 
be billions of planets um, orbiting the billions of stars in the galaxy. So that's one thing. We may also perhaps go so as to know uh, whether it's likely that life involved uh, evolved in these places or whether it was a, a rare fluke. And of course, um, this makes a bit of a difference because um, if life was very rare and it's logically possible that life is unique to this planet, I think it's unlikely, but it's logically possible. But if that's the case, then what happens this century is important cosmically, not just terrestrially, because uh, um, uh, it would snuff out the most important uh, place in the galaxy, as it were, and would snuff out huge potentialities, because um, even if uh, life was now unique to the Earth, then, as I mentioned, there's plenty of time in the future, and uh, uh, life descended from us would have time to spread entirely through the galaxy. Now, this wouldn't be human, it would be post-human. Because remember that uh, the time we're talking about for the future of the planet is very long uh, compared to the time it takes for a species to evolve. And moreover, future evolution, post-human evolution, is not going to be Darwinian selection of a kind that's led to us. It's probably going to be what I like to call uh, secular intelligent design, because it's going to be um, uh, humans who are able to redesign their progeny um, by genetic uh, knowledge or also perhaps by uh, cyborg techniques, by uh, linking ourselves to electronic uh, entities. These are all possibilities. Uh, we may want to regulate them and slow them down a bit, but these will change human beings on the time scale. shorter than Darwinian selection would. <clears throat> I've just written a book which we come out. And in this book, I say that uh, um, I hope these techniques will be re regulated, but there will, by the end of a century, be a few adventurers probably living on Mars. I don't believe there will be mass emigration because it's not very comfortable to be on Mars, but there will be a few pioneers who will go there. And those pioneers will be away from the regulators and they'll have every incentive to try to adapt themselves to a hostile environment. And they will use all these techniques to uh, adapt to a different gravity, different atmosphere, etc. And they may uh, become electronic, um, they, if that's possible. And if that happens, uh, then of course, they may be near immortal. And then uh, a long interstellar voyage wouldn't deter them. So we can imagine one science fiction scenario is that uh, um, entities which are in a sense descended from us could spread beyond the solar system, far beyond. So that's not, not crazy. But this is just one uh, potentiality um, which uh, um, would be foreclosed if we screw up too much during the century. So uh, that's the reason I think why uh, many of us um, who um, think about these long-term issues are especially concerned about what's going to happen in the next um, uh, 30 or 50 years, um, which is uh, the normal horizon for planning, the normal timescale on which we discount the future, and the timescale on which we care about uh, not only our own lives, but the lives of our children and grandchildren. So I think naturally uh, this is the uh, timescale that we focus on. Um, but of course, uh, uh, even this time scale is rather long compared to the time scales of many political decisions. Um, and so I think uh, uh, what we are trying to do um, is to promote uh, long term thinking and thinking about future generations. And uh, many of the people involved in uh, our center and in thinking about existential risks are very concerned that we should. Um, give more thought to the implications. The second half of the century will still be alive in the 22nd century, to that extent at least, and uh, make sure that we don't leave a, 
deplete, depleted and despoiled planet for that generation. And so that's the motive for the sort of of issues which uh, um, I've talked to written about and which I guess you're okay can you hear me uh yes I think your wi-fi is a bit um uh not that strong but I think we kept up with most of that uh sort of stay uh, on uh, oh yeah oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, is it? No, it's not, not very good, is it? Uh, it's it's not the best, but I think we can still hear you and you, we are still with you. Um, okay. So I think as long as you can hear us, I think it, it should be okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, just a minute, I could try something else. I've got a... Uh, I think I may have a little microphone, which might be better. Uh, I, no, I, I think if if we sort of lose you, then uh, maybe we could. Yes. Well, um, well, let me let me try. I've got another laptop, so if you could wait one minute, I'll I'll try and connect on another laptop. Uh, sure, but I think this should also be okay. This is it's uh, okay. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's just like periods of not hearing you too well, but then we catch up with you. Uh, so oh, it's okay. Okay. okay, I'm I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yes. No worries, yes. no worries. Yeah. It's just uh, okay. Wi-Fi in Cambridge. I've also had yeah. many issues with that. <laughs> yeah, yes, okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Sort of staying on a similar topic, you know, the Fermi paradox has inspired and encouraged thinking on ex extinction threats of the past 70 years. Uh, do you think there are any parallels between the discussions around the Fermi paradox and the existential risk research that we are doing today? Yes, well, this certainly is because, of course, uh, uh, the Fermi paradox uh, says that if there was lots of life out there, um, why haven't they visited? Because there'd be some which uh, uh, may have evolved on an older planet than the Earth and would have had a head start. So um, the Fermi paradox is just a statement that uh, um, the fact that we haven't already got uh, clear evidence for extraterrestrial life is perhaps an evidence that it's rare um, uh, and therefore that we would not be unique. Um, I, I uh, um, uh, read a book by someone um, at the Open University who gave 50 reasons why the Fermi paradox may not have that implication. And the second edition, we had 75 reasons. But of course, none of them are very good reasons. But let me just give you one, uh, which is that um, if we uh, imagine, as I mentioned uh, a bit earlier, uh, that future evolution is not flesh and blood, but uh, leads to things like machines, um, then of course, um, uh, it's a different kind of evolution from what's led to us. And uh, we have uh, emerged through Darwinian evolution and that favors intelligence, but it also favors aggression. Whereas uh, if uh, evolution is of machines designing more intelligent machines and things like that, then that may favor intelligence, but it may not favor aggression. And therefore, um, even if there are advanced intelligences out there, they may be um, contemplative, thinking deep thoughts, and uh, not. Uh, having any expansionist uh, ambitions, and uh, they may not even make themselves aware to us. We don't know. So um, I think um, uh, the Fermi paradox, which it makes a, an important point, almost, almost the only empirical point in the science of SETI that uh, we haven't been visited yet, um, that doesn't rule out um, one very exciting scenario uh, for the uh, uh, evolution of life, which is that it um, transforms from flesh and blood to uh, electronic, and uh, uh, and that um, uh, leads to entities which uh, think very deep thoughts, but don't uh, want to expand or um, um, travel through the galaxy. 
yeah, I think that's that's quite an interesting idea that I hadn't really thought about before personally. Uh, before I open up the floor to questions, uh, just a final one for me. How has the uh, existential risk that worry you the most, how has that changed over the past few years? Like, has that changed much after COVID hit or is it still sort of similar? Um, well, I think uh, COVID-19 has been a wake-up call and the sort of things which uh, uh, we at Caesar and uh, I and my books have written about, um, they were thought sort of flaky doom mongering by many people. Um, and I think that's less so now because um, uh, I think everyone realizes that the, the world is very interconnected and very vulnerable in a way it wasn't in the past. I mean, in the past, there were, of course, local um, collapses, local disasters. But um, uh, they didn't cascade globally. It is an example of how uh, something which um, is a really severe setback to our lives can cascade globally. And we are now more aware of the extent to which we are dependent on um, uh, um, things of the whole world. I mean, um, obviously, the internet. And of course, the COVID shutdown would be far worse if the internet had failed during that period. So we depend on things like the internet. We depend on uh, the international financial system and long supply chains. Um, and uh, uh, this, I think, has made us realize that we need to at least take precautions so that we can cope better with a similar um, event that may be even worse than COVID in its impact. And in particular, to give just one example, um, we need to um, uh, rebalance the tension between two things we want. One is efficiency and the other is resilience. And uh, uh, it's very efficient, for instance, to um, uh, have a manufacturing plant where you have long supply chains and you get something from the cheapest place in the world um, and you uh, um, have just in time delivery and don't build up stocks. Now, that makes you vulnerable to a breakage of one link in that chain. It's far better to have multiple supply chains, get things more locally and keep an inventory in stock so that you can go on making your cars, even if the uh, um, even if there's some uh, breakdown in the um, uh, transmission from the place where they're made, or where the components are made. That's one thing. And to take another example, um, uh, in this country, the National Health Service prides itself on uh, uh, using all the beds in the hospitals efficiently. That means that there's very little slack if something really bad happens. Whereas in, I know in Germany, they have a policy of leaving at least 20% of the beds in intensive care vacant in case there's a real emergency. And so that's another example where um, there's more resilience uh, if you uh, have slack in the system, uh, even though that is, in a sense, uh, costing you a bit more. So I think we're realizing that uh, we need to prepare. And also it is worth preparing because um, some estimates of the cost to the world of COVID-19 over the next few years are something like 20 or 30 trillion dollars. And in the perspective of a figure like that, it would have been worth hundreds of billions of dollars to be more prepared. Because no one could have said that a, a pandemic was all that unlikely. We'd had MERS and SARS, and we'd had a, 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 a other pandemics and AIDS, etc. So it wasn't that unlikely, but it was just unpredictable. And so I think um, it's a long answer saying that um, the uh, experience of COVID-19 has made us more aware that we need to take seriously preparedness for future events like that and uh, make our society uh, more resilient. So th that's important. And as to what these uh, risks are, uh, then of course they are uh, future pandemics and of course even more scary, uh, there's the possibility of engineered pandemics um, because um, the technique of uh, modifying viruses, so-called gain-of-function techniques. Um, this is um, uh, widely understood. And um, uh, unlike making a nuclear weapon, 
which can't be done without large conspicuous facilities, um, uh, making a dangerous uh, virus more virulent than the natural ones, um, is something which could be done by a small group um, in a laboratory of a kind which exists in many industries or um, many um, universities. Um, so that, that's one thing. And, uh, and so uh, one of the big worries that I have about the future is that um, we will uh, have to live in a world where um, a few um, bad actor individuals can have a global impact. The global village will have village idiots, but they'll have a global range and we can be less tolerant of them. And this is going to lead to real governance problems because um, we are going to have to have a trade-off between three things we want to preserve. One is privacy, privacy, the other's security, um, and the other's freedom. And uh, I think uh, if you want to ensure that uh, someone can't clandestinely produce some dangerous virus, or indeed to take a different type of risk, um, um, plan a cyber attack, knocking out a country's electricity grid or something like that, then uh, we do need to um, have more intrusive surveillance and invade people's privacy, for instance. And, uh, uh, and, and I think that's something that's going to be a, a change we're going to need to pose on society. Um, and so I think what worries me in the next 20 years is these um, uh, uh, possible threats, which can be created by um, uh, a runaway consequence of um, something like a cyber attack or cyber failure. And uh, of course, a uh, um, pandemic, which could be a natural one or an engineered one. So th th those are the risks that I worry about. But of course, um, uh, they're the risks which are caused by misuse of powerful technologies. Um, but of course, the other things we need to worry about are the ones that are, in fact, higher on the public agenda. Uh, they are um, to worry about the consequences of uh, what we are doing collectively, not as a few individuals, um, because there are more of us than ever before on the planet, 7.8 billion, and we're all more demanding of energy and resources. And um, this is why we need to worry about um, uh, climate change, um, CO2 rises, and also about um, biodiversity, about uh, um, uh, an impact on nature, which is going to lead to uh, mass extinctions and things like that. So um, that's a separate class, um, climate and biodiversity. Um, and um, obviously that's pretty high on the agenda. This is a big conference in Glasgow, in November on climate. And there's also a big international conference on um, biodiversity. And um, uh, Professor Partha Gupta, who is actually the chair of CESA, um, he wrote a report, a 600 page report for the British government, which is the British input into the Ch Chinese conference on biodiversity. And uh, this is on the web, so I recommend read it, and read it. But I think it may be as important a document as um, report written 15 years ago by uh, um, Nick Stern on climate, which is the Stern report written in 2006. And, uh, and that became an important document, sort of a manifesto for um, worrying about climate change. And in the same way, this document that Parthas Scripps has written uh, is, I think, going to have an impact on making people take seriously um, the uh, need to ensure that we don't uh, cause mass distinctions, mass extinctions, because um, to quote the great ecologist Ill Wilson, um, if uh, we, through our um, impact on nature, cause mass extinctions, it's the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. And so this is something which we, we, we need to worry about. So that's enough gloomy thoughts for me at this stage. So please, uh, unless you've got some other questions. Mm. I think I will open up the floor to questions now. So if anyone does have questions, uh, just raise your hand and you can unmute and ask it directly. Yep. Uh, Sammy, you go for it. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Lodris, for, for the talk. Hi. 
So uh, I have a question regarding, roughly regarding your background in cosmology. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to make the trade-off between, on the one hand, funding organizations like NASA or ESA to learn about how to travel or live on other planets, and then on the other hand, funding efforts to res uh, reduce existential risk that we uh, face on Earth? Um, well, I think we need to, uh, uh, as a social um, priority, we need to reduce existential risks. Um, but I think um, uh, um, most nations feel that um, it's prudent to um, spend a certain amount of money um, on um, on pure science, because of course we, if you look at the world today, uh, we couldn't be feeding uh, people or li living the kind of life we are living had it not been for um, uh, academic science discoveries in the last hundred years. I mean that's a, a platitude now, uh, so we need to do that. Um, and um, uh, the amount that's spent in um, supporting uh, academic and pure science um, in this country it's about eight billion pounds a year something like that um, and similarly in other countries um, now uh, that goes to over all fields of science um, people sometimes think a lot is going to uh, um, um, things like particle physics and space but that's not necessarily so because to take particle physics the CERN which is uh, in Geneva which is the world's biggest scientific instrument cost $10 billion, um, uh, that's uh, um, uh, very expensive, but nonetheless, only 2% of the science budget of um, Britain goes towards it. And that's because um, it's a collaboration of 20 or 30 different countries. And in particle physics, they decide to spend most of the, the money on this one big machine over 20 years. Uh, and, and so that's why it, it's one uh, enormous lump sum, but it's about 2% of, um, uh, of the budget uh, we're spending on science altogether. Um, and uh, I think most people think that's probably appropriate given it's a very fundamental uh, subject. Um, and um, space is, uh, uh, space science and astronomy, they're rather similar. Uh, the big projects are international and the amount being spent on, on space science um, in uh, in this country is about the same um, as on uh, on CERN. Uh, it's, um, space science and astronomy is, is about the same. Um, uh, uh, within space itself, of course, um, most of the money is spent not on space science, but uh, in the US, it's spent on um, defense and the human space program. And uh, uh, I personally, um, if I was an American citizen um, and taxpayer, would not want to support the human space program of NASA, um, on which they spend uh, more than half their budget. Um, the reason for that is that um, uh, as robots get better, the practical case for sending people gets weaker. Um, robots will soon be able to assemble structures in space, um, and uh, um, although they can't uh, do things a human geologist could do when they get to Mars. Um, uh, there are these probes um, trundling across the Martian craters now, um, but within about 10 or 20 years, um, they have enough AI that they could um, note any strange feature just as well as a human geologist. Um, so th there's no um, uh, scientific case, I think no practical case for funding human space flight. Nonetheless, it's an inspiring adventure in a way. But my uh, take would be, as an, if, if I was an American, and I feel this um, as a European too, um, this should be left to private sponsorship and uh, to Messrs. Musk and Bezos, in particular, who, who are doing this. Um, uh, that means that the public isn't, isn't paying. Um, but also it means something else, which is that uh, they can um, do things that have high risks attached. What makes man's space flight very expensive if NASA or ESA does it, is that if uh, uh, we're sending civilians into space, we've got to ensure they're as safe as possible. And 
in the case of the uh, American uh, um, human space program, uh, they launched the shuttle 135 times. It failed twice. And each of those failures um, was a, a big um, trauma for America. They killed a woman school teacher and the other six people in one shuttle and then a similar disaster now because it was presented as being sort of safe and routine tourism not adventure um now that was a big mistake and so i th i th i think that um messrs musk and bezos um should launch people into space but th they should um launch the kind of people who are prepared to take big risks I said the shuttle had a less than 2% failure rate, but many test pilots and people who do round the world ballooning and go hang gliding in Yosemite and things like that, they're prepared to take a bigger risk than that uh, if, if they're doing an exciting challenge. And so um, I think that human space flight should be limited to people like that. And um, uh, although I don't think it ever makes sense to have mass emigration to Mars, I do hope that there will be some people on Mars um, of that type by the end of the century. And as I said, as I said uh, um, at the beginning, um, uh, they are the people who will be away from the regulators and have the motive and the freedom to adapt themselves so their progeny turn into post-humans. And so they be cosmically important, those, those people, so we should cheer them on. Um, but I, do, I don't think uh, I would support um, uh, human space flights uh, for all the risk averse people, too expensive, and robots can do it better. Yeah. Thank you for that insightful response. Um, Anna, do you want to ask away? Uh, thank you for for sharing your insights and, and uh, instigating some some great conversation. Uh, I wonder, in what uh, in your opinion, what risks haven't gotten the attention that they have deserved uh, during the pandemic? So it feels that the pandemic has taken a lot of attention from humanity in the last two years. Um, in opinion, what risks have we not been focusing on during this time? Uh. Well, I mean, you're quite right to say that uh, um, we shouldn't um, uh, just worry about the most recent disaster because um, uh, one lesson we learned is that we were prepared for an influenza virus in, in this country, um, but we weren't prepared for a coronavirus, which had different problems in two ways. One is it required protective clothing for all the, uh, the people in hospitals, which we didn't stock up on. And also, um, it was not clear how quickly we could create a vaccine for it. Whereas for, for influenza, we knew how to create vaccines. So there are those two features of a coronavirus um, pandemic, which were not prepared for adequately. Um, and um, uh, I think we, we've learned our lesson there. Um, but if, if you ask more generally, I mean, I. I uh, I worry about, as I say, um, possible um, engineered viruses um, by a uh, uh, Wuhan laboratory, um, but I worry also about um, uh, cyber. Um, I worry about um, uh, cyber attacks. at the state level by the Russians, which would knock out the electricity grid in the eastern United States. And they say in this report, this would merit a nuclear response. Now, with AI, A, a sort of um, arms race between the um, cyber attackers and the cyber security people. It's not clear which side is winning. So we do need to worry about that. And also we need to worry simply about um, um, breakdowns. Because as I said, I mean, if, if the internet had failed in a fundamental way um, during the pandemic, during the shutdown, of course we couldn't have coped. I mean, 
was, the internet was to a large extent our salvation of keeping uh, business and life going during the last year or two. And so uh, we ought to worry about vulnerabilities in the internet um, and, uh, uh, and ensure that there's enough redundancy built in and doesn't happen. So um, uh, I think um, we've got to, as, a, as it were, defocus from the particular crisis that we've just experienced and think about some uh, uh, other kinds of bio, but also about cyber. Um, but also, um, these are sudden disasters that may befall us. Um, we've got to keep our focus on the long-term uh, concerns uh, like climate and environment degradation. Um, and of course, um, if something is urgent and immediate, there's no problem getting the attention of politicians. Whereas, as we know, the problem with um, uh, making the world safe for future generations um, despite the threat of climate change and all the rest um, is because um, uh, politicians um, tend to worry about um, what happens nearby in their own country and before the next election um, and to make them care about climate change which means um, uh, making investments that will pay off in 30 years time and will have greater benefit for countries in other parts of the world than in our country, that's a big ask for them. And so we've got to uh, make sure they do that. And of course, um, that's why we should welcome campaigning and uh, demonstrations because um, uh, I, I know quite a few people who've been government advisors in science, you know, working in government departments. And of course, they find it hard to get the minister's attention because the minister always has urgent things to worry about. Um, and what gets minister's attention um, is what's in the press or some big public campaign. And that's why I think we should welcome uh, um, charismatic figures. And uh, in the climate context, um, uh, I'd mention four very different people. Um, Pope Francis and our secular Pope David Attenborough and Bill Gates and Greta Thunberg. You can't imagine four people more different than that, but in their different ways, uh, they've all um, energized world opinion and made people uh, uh, care more about these, um, uh, uh, these, these long-term global challenges. And I think without them, uh, there'd be far less chance of governments taking the necessary action because uh, um, they will do the right thing if they think they won't lose votes by doing it. And so I think we've got to um, keep up the pressure and the demonstrations and all the rest of it. Yeah, I think maybe a follow-on question from that might be, you know, sitting in the House of Lords, what have you personally found to be the most effective engagement strategies uh, to make the government care about the long-term future? Mm, yeah. No, I, th I think we it's crucial that we, we should uh, um, make, make them care about the long-term future. Um, and uh, um, th they will if the public cares. And the public's got to campaign. Um, and um, there was one, one small instance of this in, in this country a few years ago when um, Mr. Michael Gove was the uh, environment minister and he introduced legislation to ban um, uh, non-reusable drinking straws made of plastic um, because they contribute to uh, ocean pollution. Uh, but he did that um, only because the issue of ocean pollution, which uh, I think wasn't on most people's radar at all five years ago, had been put that way by um, the Attenborough Blue Planet 2 programs, especially the uh, iconic picture of the albatross returning to its nest and coughing up for its young, not uh, the longed for food, but a few bits of plastic. And that became an iconic image, rather like the um, polar bear on the melting ice flow uh, was for climate change. And um, uh, that um, raised concern about um, ocean pollution. And uh, uh, without that, I can't imagine that Mr. Gove uh, would have... Uh,
I think okay. we lost you for that second half. Yeah. Okay, have I lost you? Oh, uh, I think we, yes. we missed Well, that. I didn't feel that much. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I was just saying that um, uh, the, the, the public has to be clamoring for action on a cause, and then the politicians will respond. Yeah, I mean, like, um, that, that, that obviously happens, but maybe on a more personal level, when you do speak to, say, a politician, uh, what, yeah. what do you find to be the most effective way to engage with them? Uh, to like make them care about uh, these long-term issues. Um, well, I mean, I think uh, um, uh, for one person won't do very much. Um, I think it, uh, that's why you've got to uh, get something in the press, have a demonstration, and uh, get public attention. Otherwise, um, uh, this long-term cause will be swamped by the more immediate worries that politicians uh, always have. So making a lot of noise and uh, getting a lot of coverage and getting wide interest and getting charismatic figures um, engaged and um, people have a following, whether they're um, you know, um, public figures, um, artists, performers, influencers and all the rest, they can all help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Ose, do you have a question? Yeah, I have one, thank you. Lord Freeth, for your most engaging discussion. I found it really helpful. So my question was related with one of the points that you have mentioned about the biomodification in the future or the quote-unquote cyborgs that we might have during the yeah. next chapter of the humanity, let's say. Mm -hmm. So while we were working on our reading group, we had this interesting conversation. Interesting, it was yesterday about yeah, so it was about how, what should we think, sorry, so we were thinking that it, the reason why we're focusing on existential risks is to maximize humanity's potential in the future. And mm -hmm. we, in on that part, we have realized that we don't really have a working concept of humanity as a whole. We were thinking about a lot of things, like should we count humanity as blood and flesh in that case? Would the descendants count as humans? Let's say that if the descendants were to count as humans, so it's about our descendants. And we were having this wild scenarios where we presume that humanity is going extinct and we cannot do anything. So we were kind of passing this mantle to an AI that has similar potential to a human. And it was sprawling its culture, humanity's culture and everything. So can we, we were thinking that even we can, can we count that as humanity's potential being fulfilled. So we were wondering where should we start? I was wondering where should we start when we talk about humanity while dealing with existential risks? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you raise a very important point um, about how one reacts to the sort of scenarios for the far future, which I were discussing, um, because it depends on um, whether um, uh, the, ent the post-human entities um, have self-awareness or not, or are they just zombies? And of course, uh, this is a problem which philosophers discuss. Um, uh, and uh, these problems are perhaps going to become practical ethics issues one day. Um, there's a question, um, uh, for instance, um, um, would a electronic entity have any kind of consciousness or self-awareness? Um, and um, uh, it's possible to have huge competence, but no comprehension. And, th and that's uh, perhaps what these uh, machines would have. And many people think that'd be sad because um, uh, if we were replaced by some entities which uh, couldn't appreciate the wonder and beauty of the universe, we'd feel that was sad. Whereas if uh, they had those abilities to an even greater extent than any of us do, uh, then that would be a plus and we could welcome our takeover by 
those entities? And this is a purely philosophical question, because you may know um, there's a lot of debate about what constitutes consciousness um, and self-awareness. Um, but I think there is a, um, another point, not quite so futuristic, um, which is about uh, whether human character while remaining flesh and blood would change because um, the one thing that hasn't changed in the last few thousand years um, is human nature. And that's why we can um, um, read classical literature from two or three thousand years ago and uh, feel some affinity for the characters there and, uh, uh, and, and what, what they wrote and how they behaved because uh, there would be no change in our basic character. But of course, um, we can't have any confidence, really, that 500 years from now, um, the dominant intellects, whether they're flesh and blood or not, will have any um, feeling or resonance with us and what we thought. And so if they try to read uh, 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 the best novels from this century, they may not understand them at all because they don't understand uh, human beings. Whereas uh, um, we can we can read Homer or something from nearly 3,000 years ago and uh, realize that, that it's uh, written about people who are in many ways just like us. Uh, so um, uh, uh, human nature, which has uh, not changed despite the big change in technology, may start to change if we can um, through um, biotech or cyborg techniques change human beings. And so that'll be a real game changer if that happens. Thank you for that. Sure. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Yeah, I think that's all we sort of have the time for. Uh, unless if Lord Martin, if you have any closing remarks or you know any advice for uh, the the graduating cohort of the well, Kerry uh, uh, Fellowship. No, I mean, I, I, I'd like. Can I? Can I just uh, um, uh, thank you for inviting me and say that uh, um, uh, I, I think one thing that I am trying to do is to make people aware of these issues um, because it's the younger generation which is going to have to deal with them, and um, um, uh, you're going to be alive at least towards the end of a century, even if not into the new century. Um, and uh, uh, I, I would encourage you to um, uh, uh, think about these issues and, um, uh, and also to um, uh, propagandize a bit, to um, make people aware of what these issues are and what can be done about them to make the world safer. Um, because as I said, um, nothing Thing will happen unless um, enough of the public are aware about them and are prepared to uh, take actions now for the benefit of future generations. Um, so so I, that's why I think what you're doing is very important and um, uh, wish you the very best of luck in uh, um, amplifying your voice if you can. Certainly a very high note to end on. Uh, thank you for coming. To speak with okay. us. It's been an honor well, to have you here. Well, thank you very much. I hope you could hear most of me. I'm sorry about the uh, um, communication not being too good. I think we caught most of your talk. Uh, so at, at okay. yeah. but yes, right. thank you. Uh, right. So right. Good. Well, thank you very much. Bye.